Good morning. I'm going to talk today about this book I just read called The Set of a Contest Delusion. And this is a bit of inside baseball within Catholicism, so if this is not your thing, I understand if, uh, if you don't watch. Uh, but for those kind of embedded within Catholicism and within the, uh, the milieu of the, uh, the post-Vatican Council Church, that is the Vatican II Council Church, uh, you know that there are some very sharp divisions in the Catholic Church, and some of the smaller factions are what they call set of a contest, and what that means in Latin is simply that the seat is vacant, the seat is empty. And so you see the little, little figures here pulling against Peter's chair. Peter's chair signifies the Sea of Rome. The man sitting in that chair would be the Pope. And so all these set of a contest are um, basically juggling a, an empty chair, pretending as though they are the remnant and that an empty chair is a point of unity. And that's the whole premise of the book, is arguing against that, uh, that viewpoint. Now, although that's the focus of the book, the author winds up uh, demythologizing the papacy. And I don't say that lightly. Um, that's, that's offensive to a lot of people. But taken in a broad view of history, that's really the only logical conclusion you can come up with, is that uh, the office of the papacy, as it exists today, is a human invention. Um, that's not to say that the, the patriarch of Rome, that seat, that patriarchal see, that's not to say that that's false or that that's man-made. Just the, the, uh, the height to which the papacy has been elevated and the power granted to it, particularly infallibility, uh, is a bridge too far. So uh, he outlines he outlines the set of a contest position. Um, it's summarized in the back, although it's summarized throughout. Uh, so you can't quite see in the video; it won't focus. Uh, but basically, what this states what this states is that. Um, in the post-Vatican II Church, it is quite easy to show a discontinuity of dogma between um, everything which came before and that which comes after. So basically, in Roman Catholic theology, that disqualifies one from their Episcopal office. And so if, if any bishop, to include the Pope, begins to teach heresy openly, um, then they cease to be the Pope or they cease to be a bishop. Well, because it can be demonstrated that practically the entire curia of Rome, to include the Pope, has defected, has uh, more or less vacated the office for the past 60 years, the, the set of a contest states that uh, they being the remnant which hold to traditional Catholic teaching are free to ignore um, the entire Roman system and to form their own congregations and in some cases to even... Uh, nominate their own pope through conclave, and that they basically reform the Catholic Church to their own liking, much like Protestants. And what that ignores is the fact that there is still a guy in Rome calling himself the pope, and that according to canon law, and according to every definition of the papacy, Pope Francis is the pope. Now this creates a contradiction because he is both the Pope and not the Pope at the same time. It depends on which element of Catholic dogma that you're considering. Um, every description of the papacy would indicate that, that uh, Francis is the Pope. But the fact that he teaches open heresy, and just, just to name two, uh, the open veneration of Pashamama, and... Uh, the the reneging or the uh, the about face done on uh, the death penalty. Uh, both of those are violations. Uh, it's religious indifferentism in the case of the pagan idol. It's a violation of natural law in the case of the re re revocation of um, of the death penalty in the uh, in the in the catechism. So those are just two examples, and I could point out many more throughout the hi the history of the papacy. Um, and so, basically, in undoing the set of a contest position, um, the, the author, John C. Pontrello, also undoes the trad Catholic position, that is, the traditional Catholic position. The traditional Catholic really um, 
it, you, as a traditional Catholic, you, you will break upon the rock of Vatican I. Vatican I, let, let me explain. Traditional Catholics typically uh, will adopt Vatican II piecemeal, stating that they'd never have to adopt anything heretical and that it's not a dogmatic council, it's not a dogmatic document, and they don't have to obey the Pope if the Pope errs. Well, the problem with that is that Vatican I is very clear. In, in the normal magisterium, the Pope is infallible. And in dogmatic declarations that are normal magisterium, as Vatican II is, they have to be accepted completely and with, docil and with docility. Um, you cannot reject any of it. So you have to simultaneously make peace with uh, the popes of the Crusades, the popes of the Renaissance, the popes of uh, the 19th century Mon uh, Montaigne's, Ultramontanism, and you have to make peace with the, the popes of the Vatican II era, which you cannot, you cannot, you cannot make these things congruent at all. You cannot pick and choose what you want to believe. Uh, with Vatican I, the papacy painted itself into a corner. The papacy painted itself into a corner, and with that, the church defected. Um, if it didn't defect before, and there, there are arguments made that it defected in, in 1054 with the Great Schism, I think that that, that could be a sound argument. Um, so what, what I would say is that uh, the, the papacy with this book, if you read this book straight way through, the papacy is demythologized. That the Pope simply becomes one amongst many bishops, and perhaps historically he had a primacy of place. He certainly did not have universal jurisdiction. He also certainly does not have infallibility. Basically, infallibility was fallibly declared in 1870. And so the fall of the Roman Church did not happen in the 1960s with V2. Uh, the fall of the Church began perhaps in the 11th century, certainly by the 19th. Um, all of this comes to fruition in the 20th century with Vatican II. And now the Church has kind of devolved into a political tool. So you have, you have Pope Francis uh, promoting um, globalist agendas. Uh, pretty openly. So, you know, this is all very depressing, particularly if you're Catholic, as I am. It's all very depressing. Uh, and where to go from here, I do not know. I do not know. But I do know that if you read this book, uh, you will understand your faith and probably uh, probably have to make peace and, and come to terms with the fact that much that you've been taught uh, is, is not really true. Um, the way forward is certainly not Protestantism. Um, the author of this book actually finds a home in um, Eastern Orthodoxy, which you know I had I had discounted years ago as being kind of just a, a disjointed group of nationalistic churches with no head. Really, that's a that's a misconception, and that's a um, that's kind of a slander. That's not really true. The, the Eastern Orthodox churches function much the same way they did in the 300s, uh, through councils and by adhering to, uh, to the canons of those councils. Um, one, of the, one of the barriers, I would say, to getting into Eastern Orthodoxy is the fact that so many of these churches are nationalistic, uh, so many of them being ethnocentric. Really, they bear the marks of their, their countries of origin. And what I've discovered lately is that there is a Western Rite, a Western Rite Orthodox Church, um, under the auspices of the Russian, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. And the Western Rite feels a lot like a Tridentine Mass, except it's in English. Uh, very approachable for somebody who's traditionally Catholic. So I may, I may begin attempting that. I may begin approaching that liturgy. Um, but this book has caused a lot of soul searching. And if you pick it up, uh, it's not that expensive. I think it was around 15 bucks. Uh, it, it can potentially change your life. So I do recommend it. 
Uh, I, do, I do recommend it particularly to traditional Catholics who are feeling despair. There's no reason to despair. Uh, you've simply adopted a belief system that contains within it a built-in contradiction, and you cannot continue bearing that contradiction about inside of yourself. You have to come to terms with it, and you have to know uh, how to proceed from there. So if, you, if you're interested in the book, if you want to know more about the book, I, I don't present all of his arguments. I, I present them in brief. But, like I say, he, dif he de demythologizes the papacy, and he shows that if you're a set of a contest or a traditional Catholic or even a, a Vatican II Catholic, you are bound to carry within yourself, within your own mind, the contradictions of the church, and you're forced to bear that burden. So give it a read, particularly if you're Catholic, and uh, let, me know, let me know what you think of it. Let me know what you think of his arguments, and uh, I'll give you updates uh, if I if I find uh, if I find community in a in a Western Rite Orthodox Church, I'll let you know how it goes. You have a good day. Bye.